everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, self-proclaimed Murder She Wrote superfan and murder mystery enthusiast, and welcome back. Today we're looking at the much-anticipated part 2 of the Magnum P.I. Murder She Wrote crossover. If you haven't seen the first part, then be sure to check it out, otherwise let's dive right into the rest of this hot mess. Okay, so last we left off on Magnum P.I., Magnum was wearing some tight-ass short shorts and making passive-aggressive jabs at Jessica for being an amateur. Now I think it would be best if you let me a competent professional look for him or her. Despite his continual awkward confusion, he cracks the case and catches a hitman who had a contract to kill one of the women staying at the beach house. Before we go any further, I feel obligated to mention that, yes, this character is portrayed by Jessica Walter, known for her roles in Arrested Development and Archer. I swear, if I get one more but roses, you forgot to mention comment. Anyway, after Magnum kills this guy, Jessica leaves and all is well. Or is it? As I started to watch the Murder, She Wrote side of the crossover, I thought, wait, what? This wasn't the ending I saw. What is going on? Is this a parallel universe? Oh my god. Disappointingly, no. That would have proved way too interesting. The episode I showcased had simply been edited to serve as a standalone episode. The continued version shows Magnum taking a shot at the hitman, who is then found shot in the back and unarmed. Even though witnesses heard two gunshots, the police conveniently couldn't find any evidence, so Magnum is put in jail, being the only suspect. Sweet! I like this new continuation. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure book where you go back and pick the non-shitty ending. Magnum finds himself in the police station being charged with murder one. He tries to reason with the lieutenant booking him to little success. Our favorite salty captain is the one on the case, much to Magnum's annoyance. Jessica rushes in to defend him because she is a firm but kind woman with a well-adjusted moral compass. Which means- Mrs. Fletcher, thank you, but maybe I better handle this myself. Captain? Oh my god, Magnum, sit down! Jessica is being so nice and he's being like, you know what? Me. Turns out in this continuation, the hitman had a perfect background. They squabble a little over the guy's intention, and the captain insists that he was just a guest at the party and an upstanding citizen who owns property and pays taxes. He also insists that they used a bunch of metal detectors to try and locate another gun, but they only found Magnums. Lieutenant, lock him up, now. <laughs> heck yeah, get in the cage. Don't worry, Jess offers to do whatever she can to help Magnum. First things first, let's check in with our favorite hairline, Higgins. Please uh, forgive my appearance. Higgins believes that the captain has a personal beef with Magnum, which is why he's so eager to lock him up. And meanwhile, the ladies who were previously staying at the beach house decide to relocate to a different hotel. Higgins still thinks that he's the main target and urged them to stay somewhere safer. Jessica decides to get freshened up to talk to... I don't know, some guy that wasn't interesting enough for me to be bothered to remember. As she's waiting, she decides to snoop. Oh, Jessica, you're so subtle. After this rousing reenactment of the crime, she finds a bullet shell nearby. How did the cops not find this? How? It's in plain sight. So this guy here was responsible for the guest list and was previously hanging out with Joan, the one the hitman was presumably after. Jessica is going for the jugular here. She is not messing around with her interrogation. Mayfield was not a friend of mine. I never even met him. Oh, how strange to invite someone that you didn't even know. The police mentioned that he was on your guest list. She also gets on his case for inviting Joan and her secretary to the party on such short notice. Just listen to this evil laugh. There's nothing unusual in that. No, of course not. <laughs> I can listen to that forever. Jess presents the evidence she found to the captain, who is extremely dismissive. He stomps off in a huff and she follows him, demanding to see Magnum. He tells her it's his personal policy that she may not see him. And then, my friends, then she goes in for the kill, saying she is friends with the governor and would love to update him on the captain's personal policies. And I intend to compliment the governor on the personal attention that you give to police department policy. The name is Browning, isn't it? Oh my god, Jess is on point today. That is a face that says, I will fuck you up. So Jess is able to see Magnum and update him, and he's still making quips about being better at investigating than she is, though eventually he does place some trust in her to figure things out. Uh, one more thing before you leave. I'm not on the case. Upon Magnum's suggestion, Jessica talks to this other dude involved who's pretending to use an IBM computer. While Jess prods him for answers about Amy and his connections to Mr. Mayfield, he resists while striking this uncomfortable looking GQ pose. Eventually, he becomes threatened by Jessica's inquiries. Enjoy your vacation. Make it brief. Our climate doesn't agree with everyone. Is he saying he's the climate? 
Hmm. Higgins and Jess return to the hotel to discuss her findings, and they decide that the main suspects must be the three ladies. You remember them, right? Pamela, Amy, and Joan. Speaking of, here's Pamela now. She claims to be returning a cookbook to Amy, which Jess takes a keen interest in. Without even asking, Higgins opens it. It's not a book. Very good! So yeah, Amy's been lugging around random jewelry and claiming it's a cookbook. Because there clearly aren't enough characters to keep up with this disaster of a plot, we're introduced to a new one, this guy. Meanwhile, Amy admits that she ran away from her abusive husband and took all of her expensive belongings with her. She thought the contract was for her, provided by her dickhead spouse. Also, this drink looks good. I would like that, please. They run into him in the hotel lobby, and Higgins is like, please F off, good day. Jess and Higgins visit Magnum so they can brainstorm. Even though Jessica has had some brilliant discoveries, he still seems flabbergasted that she's so good. In some strange attempt at negging, he compares her investigations to one of her books, admitting to reading some of it, but not finishing it because he had figured out who the murderer was early on. I already kind of figured out that your killer's a psychiatrist. Actually, it was the lawyer. So anyway, this guy's dead. And Magnum's cornball baseball cap is found at the crime scene. Captain Salt is there informing Jessica that Magnum made bail a couple hours prior to this guy's murder, so now he's accused of two murders, dang. We went from no murders in the previous Magnum PI episode to a double, quite the improvement if I do say so. Cut to Jessica running a bath. At first I wasn't sure if this wasn't just a clip from that Positive Moves video that Angela Lansbury did, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, please, please Google it. Jessica thinks she hears somebody breaking into the room. It's Magnum, trying to dodge the cops who are now looking for him. He clearly has lusty eyes for her. Look at the way he compliments her bathing garment. Well, nice robe. The sexual tension is as dense as a pound cake. They discuss how his hat could have possibly ended up at the crime scene and wonder who could be framing him for the murders. Magnum suggests that things are getting dangerous and genuinely asks if Jessica would consider leaving for her own safety, and of course she refuses. She's committed now and I respect that. Later that evening, Jessica finds Pamela flirting it up with this guy. He admits that he was there to try and talk to Joan, along with murdered McGee over here, into selling her business. Hot damn, there's a lot going on in this episode, so if you're lost, don't worry. This crossover is one of the most confusing I've ever seen. At least we have outdoor entertainment. Holy shit, did you see that? He just landed on that man's dick. We call this one the flaming foot job. On her way back to the hotel, Jess notices Amy's room has been broken into. Her abusive husband hops through the window with a crowbar, demanding the previously mentioned fine jewels that Pamela thought was a cookbook. I realize this looks pretty bad, but worry not. This is Higgins' time to shine. Make another move at your own peril, sorry, huh? Go, go, go. Quick, someone do the flaming foot job! After a mildly underwhelming fight, Higgins wins and impresses his lady love. Aww. You were magnificent! And by winning, I mean that Higgins gets slashed in the head and the other dude runs away. This is a low bar for winning. After another brainstorm, it's revealed that Joan was the one who bailed Magnum out of prison. Suspicious. And Amy's jewelry has gone missing. Suspicious. This causes the routine J.B. Fletcher epiphany. She now knows who the murderer is. She sneaks into Joan's hotel room and rifles around her luggage in a completely inconspicuous way and accuses her of having the murder weapon. I have one small detail to dispose of before I leave. Yes, you'd have to dispose of a gun and a silencer before going through airport security. She also made sure to post the bail so Magnum wouldn't have the alibi of being in jail. So why? Why did Joan do this? Well, she didn't want to sell her business. I mean, in her defense, the hitman did want to kill her, and this IBM dude was also making threats, so... You know, it's kind of confusing, really. I feel like this could have been talked through or something, but whatever. Magnum is back and dangling on the windowsill like a weirdo. He's out there forever. Like, dude, what are you doing? Get the crap in there and tackle Joan. Put it down, Joan. Are you kidding me? Put it down? This isn't the time for being diplomatic. He tells Joan that he already phoned the police, and she's like, why'd you do that? And he's like, cause they're looking for me. And after a brief back and forth, the police do bust in, and things can finally be put to rest. Oh good, the shorts are back. As Jess and Magnum take a friendly stroll on the beach, they reflect on what the hell just happened. He mentions that he didn't actually call the cops, he was just hoping someone would see him dangling off the ledge of the window and call them themselves. That seems very risky 
risky, but I suppose in a very populated resort, somebody would see him and call. Higgins joins them, ready to take Jessica to the airport. He gets flustered and starts Hugh granting it up while trying to tell Jessica he'd like to visit her in Maine sometime. Say, I, I, I was considering taking my annual holiday in New England this year, and uh, I, uh, I thought that uh, uh, perhaps you could recommend some restaurants. Right, final thoughts. Are you confused? Because I'm confused. This was a fun crossover, but it wasn't the best example of a Murder, She Wrote episode. There's just no clear motive. I did like this part more than the previous one, since Magnum was in jail for the majority of the time, and the focus was more on Jessica, as can be expected. But even though it was substantially better, it was still kind of a catastrophe. Worth watching? Absolutely. Even if it's just to see Jessica dunk on the captain and to hear her evil cackling. <laughs> and that was the Magnum P.I. Murder. Murder, She Wrote crossover. I hope you had fun, and if you have a specific episode of Murder, She Wrote you'd love to see me cover on this show, leave a comment and I will consider it. For now, happy sleuthing. My friends call me Thomas. <laughs> and I'm Jessica. Hey everyone, thanks for watching hopefully both parts of this crossover special. If you enjoyed it, consider liking it and sharing it with fellow Jessica Fletcher fans, and if you want to support this weird Murder, She Wrote endeavor, consider pledging to my Patreon campaign. I'm gonna need funds if I'm gonna cover all 12 seasons. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.